Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Diana Farias. I am one of our marketing specialists here at Mount Carmel. Welcome to our wellness webinar. Today, we will be speaking about colorectal cancer. As you might know, March is Colorectal Awareness Month. So today, we're going to be talking about the myths about colorectal cancer and really getting to the facts. Today, Dr. Charles Taylor will be joining us. He is one of our excellent providers and he has a wealth of knowledge. So can't wait to learn more. Dr. Taylor, I'll hand it over to you. My name is Dr. Taylor. I also invite you to go by Chuck. Um, we have a few slides to go over first and this my intro slide. Uh, but I am originally from Akron, Ohio. And I do part of, you know, some of my training in Michigan, but most of the rest of Akron, Ohio. If you see something on one of these slides that you want to refer back to, just remember which slide and we can go back to it. Um, you see here kind of a picture of the colon. It's about five feet long. The picture on the left illustrates that best. And when we do a colonoscopy to look for polyps or cancer, we have an instrument that goes that entire length. Um, the, the actual diameter of the colon is a few inches wide, depending on which part of the colon you're in. And then on the far right, it's kind of got a picture of um, what looks like, we call them lesions. The smaller ones would probably be polyps and the larger ones would be cancer. So we want to cover, cover some of the myths We'll go over these relatively quickly. Um, so, uh, but certainly write down any questions. Then go back over these myths one by one if people have any questions regarding them. First off, people think that only older adults get colorectal cancer. Well, you'd be correct in the sense that the average age that people get them is in the 60s. But unfortunately, in my career, um, I've found it in a 21 year old girl. And because we've been doing colonoscopies now for about 25 years preventatively, we're actually seeing colon cancer drop in the 50 and over age group, but it's going up in the 30 to 50 year old age group and we don't know why. Um, so we've moved our screening from 50 to 45. That move occurred a few years ago because of this, but we have not yet identified why younger people are getting it. So it's not a disease of just older individuals. Some people think it only affects men. Um, men have it at a slightly increased incidence, but not much, more like 55 to 45%. So it's very close to equal in men and women. Um, and men have a slightly higher incidence of polyps as well. And we know that polyps is what eventually leads to colon cancer. But again, the difference between men and women is, is minimal. This is one of the biggest ones I hear from the individuals who don't want to get a colonoscopy is that, well, I don't have any family history. Each year in the United States, there will be 150,000 new cases of colon cancer, and only about 5% of those people have any family history. So 95% of the colon cancers we find each year in the United States have no family history. So having a family history is a reason to get screened sooner, but not having a family history is not a reason to avoid getting screened. This is one of my favorite issues to talk about whether it's preventable or not. A lot of people don't want to have a colonoscopy because they're afraid of finding something bad. They'd rather just avoid it altogether. What I want to point out is that colon cancer right now is about the only cancer that is preventable. The other very common cancers, lung, prostate, breast, we're getting better at diagnosing those earlier, but we still diagnose them when they are a cancer. Colon cancers all come from polyps. So if we can take polyps out of people, you can actually prevent colon cancer, which is why I stated earlier that 
the cancer rate of colon cancer in the over 50 crowd has been dropping faster than any other cancer because we've been doing screening colonoscopies. So I can't emphasize this more. I, I, I could almost say jokingly, if we did a colonoscopy once a year on everybody from 20 years on, we would probably virtually never have colon cancer. So it's one of the only cancers that we can prevent. And I guess real quickly before we go to this one, a corollary to that last one is a lot of people think when they come to see me for colonoscopy that I'm trying to find a cancer on them. No, I'm trying to find polyps on them and remove the polyps so that I don't ever have to worry about finding a cancer on them. Myth number five, colorectal cancer is always fatal. Um, when I got out of training 35 years ago, um, if it had already gotten into your lymph nodes, you only had a one in three chance of making it. Now, if it's in your lymph nodes, we're already greater than a two out of three chance of survival and starting to approach 75%. So the vast majority of people that I treat for colon cancer, we cure. Um, so it's one of the more curable cancers. Um, by the time colon cancer symptoms are noticeable, the advancement of cancer is much further if we find it when people are asymptomatic. But again, what I want to emphasize is when I started practice 35 years ago, we didn't do a colonoscopy unless someone had symptoms. So we were of the mindset of just trying to find colon cancer. And because we waited until people had symptoms, such as bleeding or abdominal pain or a change in their bowels, we frequently had the cancers found when they were much more advanced and harder to cure. Now that we do colonoscopies on asymptomatic normal people just for screening, the few cancers we find are usually much earlier and less advanced. But what we're really trying to find are polyps before they turn into a cancer so that we can actually prevent the cancer from occurring at all. Um, and yes, eating a healthy diet and exercise regularly um, can lower your risk of colon cancer. Um, so certainly all of these things are recommended. Um, and, you know, we could go into details if one wanted, but generally what they think is a lower fat in your diet and higher fiber. Um, but again, these things alone are not enough. Screening is also necessary. Every now and then I see someone who's a real health nut and they think because they eat well and exercise, they don't need a colonoscopy. And unfortunately, even healthy people are still at risk. Um, so colonoscopies, you're completely asleep for colonoscopy. So painful isn't an issue. Inconvenient, a little bit. I've had five colonoscopies on myself. The worst part is the day before. It's the bowel prep. So the day before, you have to have a liquid diet all day, and then you have to drink some type of prep in the evening, and then the next morning that gives you diarrhea for a few hours. So that's the worst part. Um, but for once every five to ten years, one day of a liquid diet and some diarrhea is for something that's very worthwhile is worth it. But the procedure itself, you're completely asleep for, and so you don't feel anything. And did you want me to talk about this slide or did you want to talk about it? I can talk about it, Dr. Taylor. Um, essentially, the importance of getting a colonoscopy like Dr. Charles Taylor just announced, it kind of leads us to making sure that we speak to your primary care provider. As mentioned, prevention and early detection is important. If you scan this QR code, it'll take you to InQuicker, which is where you can schedule a primary care visit with your provider, or if you're looking for one, that would be an excellent way to start. Now, in case you joined us a little late, you can definitely leave questions in the Q&A section of our Zoom. You'll see it towards the bottom. And we did have a few questions that were submitted to us on social. The first one being, is it hereditary? So again, 5% of the cases we find each year in this country do have a hereditary component. We're understanding it better and better. Um, there's a number of genes now that we actually can isolate so that if we do find colon cancer on somebody and they have a family history, we can actually study specific genes 
to try and see who in the family is at risk. Um, and again, we will then go and test everybody pretty much in the, in the family tree below that point to see who might be carrying those genes. But the majority, 95% of colon cancers each year, do not have a genetic connection. That's really good to know. I know I didn't know that. So that's, I think that's important to keep in mind. The second question that we had was, I read that the age of colonoscopy has changed. At what age do you recommend we begin to get tested? Good question, because I only mentioned that we had moved it from 50 to 45. But there are some other numbers you should know. That's for the normal risk person with no family history. Let's say you are you have a first degree relative, a mom, dad, or a sibling who's had colon cancer. Then it's five years earlier than that. It's 40. So if you're a 41-year-old and your dad had colon cancer, even if he had it at age 70, you should be getting screened at 40, not 45. And then to make it even a little more confusing, let's say your mom or dad got it at a young age, say at 47. Well, then you're supposed to be screened 10 years earlier than they got it. So for a father at 47, the children should be screened at 37. Um, so the, trying to simplify it again, 45 years is when we do everybody, even the low risk person. Age 40, if you have anybody in the family with colon cancer, regardless of the age, and if you had someone who got it young, you're supposed to get screened 10 years before that parent. Great, thank and you. Parent, or I should say sibling. Recently, I saw someone whose younger sister had gotten it in her 30s. So if they have any other siblings, they should be getting it in their 20s because she got it so young. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Another question that we received on social through Instagram was, what is the number one thing you would recommend to decrease your chances of developing colorectal cancer? I would have to say the colonoscopy. As much as I would love to tell you exercise and diet, unfortunately, we all see very healthy people who still get colon cancer. And again, I can't emphasize the fact that this is a preventable disease. If you get your colonoscopies at the right age and you keep getting it done, it should be unbelievably rare for people to be able to get colon cancer. One of the things we talk about, which maybe someone's thinking about right now but hasn't posted the question is, if you've just had a colonoscopy where all the polyps are removed, how long would it take for a new cancer to grow? We call that the polyp cancer sequence. And what that means is you have a normal lining of your colon, starts growing abnormally and turns into a polyp, and then that eventually grows into a cancer. We think that that is a five to 10 year process. Okay, so it's not like you can get a cancer in a year after a colonoscopy. So that's one of the reasons we emphasize, get your colonoscopy, get rid of any polyps you have, and then you have five to 10 years where you can be pretty safe that it would take that long for something bad to grow. And if you have polyps, we make sure we do you at the five-year mark. Now, some polyps were starting to change to seven years if we think they're a little bit less risky. But the bottom line is, Probably the safest thing you can do if you're asking for one thing is do your colonoscopy when you're supposed to and continue to get them as often as you're required. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We have a couple questions on the chat. What are some signs you need to be checked for colon cancer? So if you're worried about symptoms and signs, um, obviously rectal bleeding would be one. Um, abdominal pain might be a symptom. A change in your bowels, that may be one of the more subtle ones. If you've gone your whole life and you're someone who just has one bowel movement a day, and now suddenly you've noticed after the, over the last six months, you started going to two a day and then three a day and then four a day, and, that, and you can't explain that change. You didn't start a new diet. You didn't get put on a new medication. Then certainly any type of change in your bowels would be another reason. So Probably the most common ones would be abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, and a change in one's bowels. That's good to keep in mind. Uh, Laura asked, I recently had a colonoscopy. My prep began one week before the procedure. I had to stop eating nuts, 
fresh fruits and vegetables, as well as red foods. Is this a recent change in procedure? So, not really. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there are certain products that we eat that stay in our GI tract a little bit longer. Um, the, the healthy food. So the stuff we all should be eating more of, fruits and grains and nuts and seeds, those things don't get broken down as easily as products, you know, like meats and cheeses and those things. So um, the person that eats poorly, that eats hamburgers and fries, those people are a little bit easier to clean. They can actually just stop eating the day before. But if, if I have someone who really eats a lot of seeds, corn and nuts, and they only stop those the day before, their colon will be clean in the sense that the prep will be clear, but the seeds and the nuts will be still in the colon and they will plug the scope and frequently they can't finish the colonoscopy. So most of our instructions say you can stop eating just regular food the day before, but anything that's high fiber, nuts and seeds and those types of products, you need to stop. Now I had I don't do a week. That's probably a hair on the long side, but we usually do like three to four days for those products. Thank you. Someone else asked, what is the most effective form of treatment if cancer is found? Almost always colon cancer is treated surgically. Um, we use chemo and radiation when it's necessary for more advanced tumors. But if you have a, an early colon cancer, it's always surgery as a treatment. Thank you. I believe we answered all the questions. If anyone else has any other question, oh, I think one just popped up. After the first colonoscopy, if we all test okay, how often after that should one test again? So again, that would depend on a lot of factors, but let's start with the person with no risk. So the person who has no family members with either colon cancers or polyps. So they get their first one at 45. If they're negative and they do not have any polyps, we would say 10 years for that person. Now, let's say you have a family history of polyps or colon cancer in first degree relatives, a mom, dad, brothers and sisters, then we're going to put you on a five-year schedule. Now, if we happen to find lots of polyps on large ones, sometimes we have you back in three years and occasionally one year. But that's based on the findings we had on you. And then if at your next colonoscopy you have nothing or less than three, then you'd go back up to five. So it's a little bit complicated, but um, I would say I scope about a 1,000 people a year, and I bet you... 80% of those are on a five-year schedule and only about 10 to 20% are on a 10-year schedule. And then I have a few that are on one and three-year schedules. Thank you. I see one more question. Is there an upper age range at which a person no longer needs a colonoscopy? Excellent. Is it the same? Oops, sorry. Okay. Is it the same if the person has a family history of colorectal cancer? So, um, no, the upper age, well, it's actually, it's a good question because none of us are really taught an upper age, which I have a problem with personally, because um, I know a lot of my patients who were told at what I think is a very young age, like 70 or 75, even if you at 65 told not to do this anymore. But if you think about it, it's actually relatively easy to figure out. You don't even have to be in the medical field. If I just told you it takes five to 10 years to grow a cancer, you don't want to be stopping it when someone still has 25 years of life in front of them. So 60-year-olds probably going to live at least another 20 years. They should still be getting it. So I actually looked at actuarials, at insurance company actuarials, and I looked at them um, – you know, to see how long people live. I was a little shocked that the typical 80 year old lives nine more years. But once you hit 90, you only live four more years. So um, I usually use 85 as my cutoff, but that's assuming good health. Now I have people in their seventies who already have advanced dementia or other high risks. So I obviously would not advance um, 
passed you know, to, to 85 on those individuals. But I, you know, I tell people my mom at 86 still sold real estate and still played in an 18 hole golf league. And, you know, I wouldn't tell someone like that to stop having colonoscopies at 70. Um, so I personally, in my healthy patient population, stop at 85. Thank you. That was a good question. That's for routine screening. Um, and obviously, if you're 86, still doing great, and now you have one of those symptoms that we discussed earlier, suddenly you've had a change in your bowels or bleeding, well, then we would scope you for symptoms. But for routine screening, I stop at 85 if the person is in good health. Got it. Another question we received is thoughts on non-invasive options for average risk patients like Cologuard, which I may have mispronounced it. No, you, you pronounce Cologuard. So okay. I've been telling my residents for years that I think DNA testing is the future. In fact, I was saying that 15, 20 years ago before Cologuard was around. Cologuard is the first version of it. Now, the results are for the first version there i guess what we would expect but um colon cancer they only miss about seven and a half percent so you think okay 92 and a half percent that's not bad but that does mean that out of every hundred people who have a colon cancer in them that you do a colon guard you're going to miss it in seven to eight of them but that's not what scares me because i've tried to make it clear to you we no longer are really looking for colon cancer. We're looking for polyps because we want to prevent colon cancer. And the colon guard misses 60 to 80% of polyps. And that's what's concerning to me. Um, think of it this way. When I first got out in practice, we were only scoping people looking for cancer. And so we didn't do them until they had symptoms. And unfortunately, the cancers were much more recent. And for those of you who are old enough, then Katie Couric, got on TV and did a colonoscopy after her husband, of who was 41 years old, died of colon cancer. And it was after that that the whole mindset in this country changed, which was let's scope people who are healthy and asymptomatic and let's remove their polyps so that they don't get colon cancer. So we've been doing that for 25 years. We're seeing colon cancer drop. And now we introduce this product, Cologuard, which misses, and the actual number is 58 to 82% of polyps which means we've gone backwards. Now we're missing polyps and we're just waiting until we detect a colon cancer. So I guess I'd say, do you want to do a test on yourself that pretty much is only going to find it when it's converted to a cancer? Or do you want to have a test done that gets it when it's a polyp and when we can remove it? So um, I do find the Cologuard is great for that patient of mine who keeps refusing their colonoscopy. It's amazing. I can tell them all the reasons year after year they need a colonoscopy and they won't do it. The minute I get a Cologuard and it's positive, then they agree to have the test. So I'm glad the test is out there. I use it for my patients who keep refusing colonoscopy. But for anyone who's reasonable, the best test by far is a colonoscopy. I am hopeful that in the future that test will be as accurate as a colonoscopy. And then we will only be doing colonoscopies on people who that test is abnormal. I'm betting that's another 10 to 20 years down the road. Thank you. Now, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A section. So if someone was interested in scheduling a primary care appointment, I'll go ahead and put the QR code back in here um, for anyone that would like to scan it. And actually, I see one more question. Do you have to schedule through your primary care first? So that would depend on your insurance because the last thing you want to do is do this and get stuck with the bill um and i cannot keep up with insurance plans once i asked my business manager she said we were on over 200 different plans um some of the plans that want to save money don't ever want to do anything expensive without running it through the primary care system first it's what they call a kind of a gatekeeper system they they don't want the patient to be able to jump straight to specialists knowing that specialists cost more. They want you to go to your primary care doctor, let them see if they can sort things out, and let them be the one that refers you. So if you have a gatekeeper plan and you were to go straight to me and not get a referral from your primary care doctor, there's a chance your insurance might not pay for that. Now, normally a referral from your primary care physician does not even require you to go see them. If you were to 
you know, I remember when I was younger and my doctor said I only had to come in every three years. Let's say I saw my doctor at 44, and so I wasn't supposed to come back till I was 47, but now I just turned 45, and it's time to get colon cancer screening. Usually, all you have to do is call the doctor's office and say, hey, could you have my primary care doctor send a referral for colonoscopy? And that would just be sent straight to our office, and then you could get it without even having to go see your primary care. Now, a lot of executives are kind of have a more expensive insurance plan where um, their company insists they get a colonoscopy. I, I even had a few patients, very high up executives, who their company even paid to get them screened before the national average. Um, so if you have a plan like that, well, you could come straight to see us, you know, and it would be covered. So I guess to be safe, run it by your insurance company first. Although I'll be honest with you, trying to call insurance companies and get straight answers is not easy. Probably the easiest is just call your primary care doctor and say, could you just please send a referral for this? All right, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Please feel free to drop it in the Q&A. If you joined us a little late and missed the first half of this webinar, we will be uploading it to our Mount Carmel Health website, so you'll be able to find it there. Now, I don't see any more questions. So Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. I know that I learned a lot and I'm glad that we were able to have this conversation. Thank you very much. Right. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.